welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kaui Lucas. In our show this time, we'll visit the 2017 annual briefing to the legislature by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum at the state capitol. The briefing looked at some of the earlier energy initiatives that have not been completed and asked what we can learn from them. It was the forum's 13th annual briefing to the legislature and was entitled Finding Continuity, inquiring into what happened to various earlier energy initiatives and what should be done next. The forum works hard to organize community events and programs that advance clean energy. Its members include government, academia, utilities, oil and gas companies, labor, trade associations, and environmental organizations. The briefing's intended to update the legislature and the public on how things are going and what we need to focus on in the coming session. That task was more difficult this year because of the many uncertainties we've had at home and in Washington. As everyone knows, we had a tumultuous 2016, consumed by the next era merger and, of course, the national elections. Last year's briefing was about what we called staying the course, but the 100% renewable energy generation and community solar laws of 2015 were not followed by further legislation in 2016. We learned that the energy community cannot take its hands off the stick even for a moment. And, looking back, we have passed a number of bills in the last decade for a number of energy programs. Many of these seemed promising when they were passed, but have since been forgotten. For better or worse, they have lost their luster. We should ask which ones succeeded and which ones didn't, and why, and what that teaches us. Indeed, what programs will be relevant these days? Sometimes it's hard to find focus on that. This year's briefing began with remarks from Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the forum, she welcomed the legislators, forum members, and the public. We represent individuals and organizations committed not only to clean energy, but as importantly, to a collaborative approach in seeking smart solutions for our clean energy future. We bring together our diverse perspectives to address controversial and emerging issues in energy, and always, always with the public interest as our core interest. While our individual agendas may, may sometimes conflict, we have stayed together all these many years. We celebrate this year, our 15th year together, our 15th anniversary. The forum seeks to inform and educate through briefings such as this, our 13th annual, our Clean Energy Day in August to inform and engage the broader public, and our dialogues and working groups on initiatives and legislation that matter. Chris Lee, chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection, then spoke about the future of clean energy in Hawaii from the legislature's point of view. Aloha. You know, a year ago, we stood here, some of us sitting together in the midst of great uncertainty. And I think everyone was uh, on the edge of their seats waiting to figure out how we're going to move forward with our energy future, who would own the utility, what would that look like. And I just want to take a moment because that uh, nearly 20 month process uh, obviously came to a close. I just want to recognize the PUC and their staff who poured their heart and souls into doing the due diligence uh, into that docket. Where are you guys? Can you please stand? Carl Friedman, the facilitator for the forum, presented the forum's clean energy performance report and discussed the forum's initiatives on leadership in energy generation and targets for transportation. Uh, I've been managing a clean energy and metrics uh, status reports project for the forum over several years. Uh, we've been trying to identify what it makes sense to measure, develop meaningful um, metrics to measure progress with clean energy. We're maintaining and publishing that uh, data and developing status reports. And the current status of that project is we are taking all of the uh, data sets that we have, we're getting those electronically, automatically updated, and they will be available in the first quarter of this year electronically to any organization or person who wants to get on there uh, for access to uh, what's a very large amount of uh, energy sector related data. Uh, two other uh, initiatives that are new this year, uh, or as the end of last year, uh, one is an electric power sector working group and a transportation sector working group. These are both facilitated, stakeholder-driven uh, 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 processes. The forum's providing the venues and the facilitation. 
The electric power sector working group is working on reviewing the roles of the various stakeholders, uh, how planning gets done and by who, and uh, what types of incentives exist uh, for clean energy so people are working together with the right incentives moving forward. The transportation sector working group is working on performance uh, metrics, goals, targets, strategies, and trying to tackle this difficult problem in the transportation sector is there's no unified uh, agency or entity who's in charge of all the different moving pieces. We have, uh, we have agencies in charge of building roads, we have, uh, in the, we have the counties, we have the state, we have planning uh, for land use, we have planning for transportation, we have agencies that run transportation systems, but there's not any unified uh, entity, really, who's in charge of it all to, to move forward in a coordinated way. PUC Commissioner Tom Gorak then gave us a report on what is pending and contemplated by the Public Utilities Commission. Given the theme of this conference, I can't believe that no one has yet quoted the great Stevie Wonder, whatever happened to the world we knew. Um, well, that world, as all of you in the audience know, is gone, and we won't be returning to it anytime soon. That world was, you walk in a room, you flip on the light switch, at the end of the month, you pay the bill. That's done. Next era is done. That's good. There are many, many issues on the PUC's plate, and while you may not have followed them while we were doing the Next Era proceeding, we did not forget them, and we continued to work on them during that period. Uh, it's the great acronym uh, list of things to do, the PSIP, DER, DR, decoupling, CBRE, grid modernization. Uh, I'll try to fill you in a little bit on where we are on each of those dockets uh, right now. The Power Supply Improvement Plan, or PSIP, Carl just alluded to a little bit. This is the blueprint for future action. It really is an in-depth look at the entire system of the electric utility, from generation to, dis to transmission to distribution, but also we look at what resources we have on the customer side of the meter. We have had two and now three, as of December 23rd, iterations of the PSIP. The Commission has issued critiques on two of them. And the Commission in its last order in August stated that it wanted to bring the docket to a close and that it was looking for finalizing the PSIPs and what could be done in the short run defined as a five-year term. So there were some significant changes. I think Carl alluded to them and what has just been filed uh, in the short term, much more storage uh, on the utility side, no LNG or cable in the short run. Uh, and there was also a proposal to meet the 100% goal by 2040. The schedule in that proceeding is that parties are due to file information requests on that by January 17th. The responses are due by January 30th, and statements of position are due by February 13th. Our keynote was Gavin Bade, editor of the Utility Dive Energy APA newsletter. He spoke about national changes in energy and what those changes mean for Hawaii. So if there's one thing that journalists like myself really, really like to do, it's, it's find an analogy, right? Find a little trope, a metaphor, something that can make a really complicated subject easier to understand. And uh, I think the, the best one that I could come is the best of times, worst of times, going back to Charles Dickens. Uh, and I say that because, you know, we're really entering 2017 at the, in, in a gigantic energy paradox, right? On one hand, we've got, you know, a, the flaming haired climate denier who's going to be the next inhabitant of the White House next week. Um, and, you know, for, for a world that's already behind the pace to limit global warming to two degrees this century, I mean, losing the, diplomatic and policy will of the largest economy in the world would seem to be catastrophic, right? That's how I thought of it the day after the election. I think a lot of other people did as well. But, you know, Trump's vocal skepticism, renewables, and promise of a coal resurgence, they really belie conditions on the ground. Uh, in fact, renewables in 2017 enter the year into their best market position ever. They're competitive with natural gas and cheaper than coal across large swaths of the country. Um, and no matter what Donald Trump and his administration do with the clean power plan and renewable energy tax credits, the price is going to continue to fall for these resources and they're going to continue to grow throughout the next administration. 
So as you may have seen, a lot of those economic realities have spawned some very optimistic takes about um, energy in the Trump administration. You know, things like Donald Trump can't stop the clean energy revolution. Well, those headlines, they're correct, right? Uh, but the problem is the pace of the revolution is far too slow today, as you all know, to allow the US to hit its decarbonization goals under the Paris Accord. And the absence of federal action means that we're, we're liable to fall further behind over the next administration. But fortunately, that's not the end of the story, right? A number of proactive states and jurisdictions, you guys probably first and foremost, are setting ambitious clean energy and decarbonization targets and devising market mechanisms to preserve and expand clean energy on the grid today. Uh, from my standpoint, from the standpoint of many people I talk to in, in Washington and across the nation, the success or failure of these initiatives on the state and local level is going to provide a path for the decarbonization policy when the pendulum inevitably swings back the other direction. Uh, going back to Dickens and putting it simply, it's jurisdictions like yours that are going to determine if we enter an age of wisdom on climate or an age of foolishness. Our panel, led by Mike Hamnett, co-chair of the forum, was called Finding Continuity, Whatever Happened To, and What's Next For. It included Jeff Michelina of Blue Planet Foundation on the Community-Based Renewable Energy Program and the Green Energy Market Securitization Program, that is GEMS, Jay Griffin of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute at UH on on-bill financing, Stan Osserman of the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, that is HCAT, on the Hydrogen Economy Plan, and Scott Turn of HNEI on the Bioenergy Master Plan. Uh, Carl mentioned that, that a number of things that were put on, put into law, including the Noble Portfolio Standards and the Energy Efficiency Portfolio Standards and other things, you know, have come to fruition and they and they've started to bear fruit. Uh, I mean, we haven't made the kind of kind of uh, progress we would like to in transportation, but certainly in the electricity sector. We have. Uh, we're going to be going back and looking at, at uh, a series of laws that, uh, that the legislature passed and were signed into law. And, and the, the uh, title of this panel is Whatever Happened To? And when these things were passed, they were kind of hot topics. Um, and most of them look like the, the, the motivation, there were three motivations for this on the part of the legislature. I could be wrong, but I think that's what they were. One is, uh, to ensure that we have affordable, accessible, and equitable uh, access to clean energy. So everyone, everyone's familiar with this concept, and Commissioner Gorak kind of shared a little bit of the background. But as, essentially, the idea is, uh, on our path to 100%, um, can we all go together? And can we make sure everyone has access to the benefits of renewable energy? Ohana means family, means no one, no one gets left behind. Uh, and I think it's instructive to look at the history of this uh, policy uh, to see how we can move other policies uh, more quickly. Uh, this was such a great idea, and yet it's been five years in, and we still don't have a program in place. So the problem that we're seeking to solve was, was this. Um, this wasn't the problem. This was a revolution that some 80,000 families took advantage of. One in three single-family homes have uh, a power plant on their roof supplying power to the grid. They're part of the solution. But all of this left folks who are renters or folks who live in high-rises otherwise out of the equation. So how can we, how can we rectify this? Um, and, and, and that was the idea. And not just in Hawaii, uh, NREL looked across the country and some half of the residents can't participate in clean energy. They just can't host solar, they're a renter, they don't have adequate rooftop space, uh, they're in a high rise or what have you. It's probably a higher number here in Hawaii because the number of folks in uh, multi-family dwellings. So that's the challenge we're trying to solve. It's a very simple concept that customers can put on the bill as they install renewable or energy efficiency improvements to their home, the, the opportunity to attach the, uh, that obligation uh, to their utility bill as opposed to paying a, a private company. So basically the ability to pay off, finance, some sort of improvement to your home or business using your bill. Uh, there's lots of opportunity and benefit, but primarily the, the key driver here is that customers tend to have a better bill repayment history with their electric, electric utility bills than uh, other forms of consumer credit for similar, similar obligations. Hawaii Revised Statute 19610, which is the Hawaii Renewable Hydrogen Program. The, work, the capital fund, the special fund, was very controversial when it, when it started to be executed. And I'm not going to go into the details of that because, quite frankly, they're pretty ugly. I mean, seriously ugly. I will say, in hindsight, that I think that because of that ugliness, that the uh, Hawaii Re Renewable Hydrogen Program really never got off the ground. 
I was going to read the renewable energy hydrogen energy program entirety in the log, so it only takes two minutes. It was a, uh, a stakeholder driven event uh, or project, and it was funded by, sorry, the state of Hawaii and, and uh, the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, as I said, it was a stakeholder driven document, um, and it produced a series of recommendations uh, intended to provide direction for uh, policy support as well as uh, research. Um, the kind of overarching question there was, does Hawaii have uh, the capacity to um, provide a substantial portion of its electricity and transportation fuels from uh, biomass resources? To wrap things up, we heard from Colin Moore of the UH Public Policy Center his talk was called Beyond the Soundbite, Legislation That Matters. The subtitle of my lecture should be is why we need to think about politics when we make energy policy for Hawaii. You know, this, the, 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 the title of this uh, uh, form is really to, I think, to help us think about what happens after the signing ceremony ends and the pens are put away. Uh, why do some policy reforms endure while others are quietly reversed or eroded away? Um, and as you all know, enacting far-reaching energy policy solutions is a tough task. Uh, politicians like to deliver measurable benefits to constituents, uh, but climate change is an intergenerational and global problem. But difficult as it is, passing bold measures is just half the battle. These victories must be sustained. When, even when new laws are in place, the sustainability of efforts to limit damage from climate change cannot be taken for granted. So we need sustainable policies, and by that I mean we need politically sustainable policies. So policy sustainability for me refers to the capacity of a reform to maintain its integrity and deploy core principles to guide implementation and stave off pressures for debilitating changes. And research from a number of social scientists suggests that the most uh, uh, durable reforms stick not because they're frozen in place. In other words, the battle isn't over when the law is passed, but because they reconfigure politics in ways that preserve our core principles and spur continuing momentum. Now, I have a few examples I was going to give you, but I'm not going to do those. I'm just going to leave you with uh, the question of how do we do this? How do we achieve this policy political sustainability? And I have three thoughts. Uh, the first is that sustainable policies should undercut support for opponents of reform. For example, by weakening industries or interest groups that don't want the new policy direction. This is the part about thinking politically when we design policies. The second is that sustainable policies reconfigure institutional authority and change the venues in which decisions are made. Uh, for example, by stipulating that an independent agency and not the legislature will be in charge of future policy modifications. And then finally, and most importantly, sustainable policies create what I call positive feedback by encouraging citizens, businesses, and interest groups to adjust to new ways of doing things. Once that happened, these groups become reluctant to have reforms repealed or fundamentally changed because they want to protect their investments in new technology and in new ways of doing things. Uh, so that essentially is the, the two-minute version of my 10-minute talk. Um, and that all to say that as you think about creating and crafting uh, sustainable environmental policies, we also need to think about creating politically sustainable policies. Thanks, everyone. It seemed clear from the discussion that political will cannot end at passing a given bill. It must continue after the bill is passed to make things happen. Without that, many well-intentioned initiatives can come to naught. It also seemed clear that some initiatives do become irrelevant, and once they do, to avoid confusion, we need to terminate them. The transformation to clean energy requires us to find new ideas. It also requires us to leave old ones behind. It's the nature of change itself. A couple of days later, we had keynote speaker Gavin Bade on our Think Tech State of Clean Energy talk show, where he summed up his thoughts and takeaways from the briefing. Basically, I, you know, kind of thinking about how to frame this, this question of climate and clean energy in the Trump era, um, I've done a very journalistic thing and resorted to a shorthand trope. Um, and that is that it's kind of, for climate and clean energy, it's the best of times, worst of times, right? Yes. Um, when it comes to, 
you know, the beginning of 2017, we have this big energy paradox, right? It's, we have a climate denier going in the White House who said he's going to cancel the clean power plant, potentially pull us out of Paris, although Rex Tillerson is saying some other things about that now. Um, but for a planet that's already kind of behind the pace in limiting carbon emissions to kind of limit uh, our temperature increase to two degrees this century, um, the loss of that diplomatic will from the federal government would seem to be catastrophic for the planet, right? For I think the planet, that, yes. Well, I think that's the way a lot of people looked at it the day after the election, and certainly from an environmental standpoint, that was my initial reaction, right? You've changed um, your mind? Well, uh, not exactly, <laughs> but I think that there's, it's not all gloom and doom. There is reason for hope, and I think that's because there are states like Hawaii that are doing really ambitious things, setting ambitious targets, and figuring out how to make a clean energy economy and a clean energy power generation system that can power the rest of the clean energy economy. Um, so basically my thesis for everyone here in Hawaii is that you're going to show us how to do it. Um, you know, I don't think climate denial will be the, uh, the policy of the U.S. federal government forever. Um, so if and when the pendulum does swing back the other way... I sure <laughs> hope it's soon. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I will, you know, <laughs> leave those value judgments up for anyone. But for, I think for, from the standpoint of climate action, if and when it does swing back the other way, we do want to do something federally on climate. Um, states like Hawaii are going to show us how to do it, and they're going to dictate whether we can do it cost effectively for consumers. Yes, clean energy is critical to Hawaii's future, but setting our 100% goals is one thing, and achieving them is another. Meeting those goals is not something we can wait until 2045 to do. It's something we need to work on right now. The forum is hoping the 2017 legislature will focus on what's relevant for the long term, programs that will remain relevant beyond the election cycle, that will be affordable, accessible, and reliable, and help us avoid the distractions of oil, weather, politics, and geopolitics. The Forum presents these briefings in the hope that our policymakers will be better prepared to preserve our economy and our state. Now more than ever, short-term thinking on energy is unacceptable and dangerous for Hawaii. Think Tech tries to raise public awareness on these issues and has five energy programs in its lineup. Marco, Mina, and Me, Power Up Hawaii, Energy in America, Stan the Hydrogen Man, and our flagship program, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Check them out on thinktechhawaii.com. And don't forget to check out the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum itself at hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar, and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And good news, we are now posting podcasts of all our shows on iTunes. See our website for links. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to think at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. 
We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. And yes, you can call into our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call in to 415-871-2474 and pose a question or participate in the discussion. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Cowie, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Cowie does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kawi Lucas. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.